Yeah. Yeah, so, so challenges, we don't look for challenges and that's gonna be part of the talk. We don't look for challenges, but the, the reality is that often the challenge brings out the best within us. And that's Jacob's experience. Now, what this sicha, what this talk is going to think about is going to talk about what gives Jacob the spiritual protection to allow him to be successful despite being in a difficult circumstance in a foreign land. And it's based on a medrash, which the medrash seems like very nice, but it doesn't seem that deep. And the Rebbe is going to analyze the medrash and explain what it means, spiritually speaking. And the sicha, has, the talk has two parts. We'll certainly do the first. We'll see about the second. We'll see what happens. We'll see if we have enough time. But let's start with the Medrash. And again, the Medrash's his job is not to explain everything. It's a little poetic, and it's our job to understand what the Medrash is saying. So we'll read, we'll read the Medrash, and we'll see what the interpretation is. OK, so the verse in our Pasha says that he, on the way out, he, Jacob is leaving Be'er Sheva. And he's going to Haran, and he reaches, reaches the place, which later we'll learn is the place of the temple, but whatever the case is, and he rested and he went to sleep in that place. Says the Medrash, the Medrash says, that place he stepped, he's, he rested. So Jacob slept for that night. But there was 14 years that Jacob was studying Torah before then, he didn't sleep. I guess he didn't sleep a full night. And then another interpretation, that night he slept. But the 20 years that he was working for his uncle, Lavan, in Haran, those 20 years he did not sleep. In fact, that's later when they have a confrontation 20 years later, Jacob is running away and his father, his father in law catches up and they meet. And Jacob says, I was very loyal to you. And one of the things he says is that and I, my sleep wandered from my eyes because he was so dedicated to dealing with Lavan's possessions and love on sheep. Okay, so that's the first point the Medrash makes. The guy didn't sleep 20 years, he was working really hard. Next, Medrash continues. What did he say? Mahaya Omer, what did he say? He's there for 20 years. What did he say for 20 years? Like, what did he do? How did he keep busy? Well, we know how he kept busy with, with, with dealing with the sheep, but what did he say? What, what, what was Jacob saying? That's the Medrash's question. We'll explain what that means. Says the Medrash, he said the 15 chapters of Psalms that begin Shir Hamalot, a song of ascents. If you look at the book of Psalms, there's 120, 150 Psalms. Psalm number 120 to Psalm 134, they all start the same way, Shir Hamalot, the song of ascents, the songs of going up. Why the 15 songs of Shir Hamalot is different interpretations. One interpretation is that in the temple between what they call the, the uh, Ezrat Nashim, between, between the, the place, the, the courtyard of the Israelites, and then where the priests were, there were 15 steps. And the Levites would stand on those 15 steps, and they would sing. So the 15 poems that begin, song for of a sense, really ma'alot, a ma'alot could be an ascent going up, but it could also mean a ma'ala, also means a, ste a step. So there's 15 steps. The Levites stood on the 15 steps, singing 15 poems. Okay, that's one interpretation. But in any case, um, David is the one who writes the 15 poems of Shir HaMa'alot. Says the Medrash, what did Jacob do hundreds of years earlier for the 20 years in the house of, uh, in the house of Lavan? What did he do? He sang the Shir HaMa'alot. Wonderful. What, why the Shir HaMa'alot? There's no other Psalms he could say. Of course, remember, the Psalms were not written yet. It means he would have to know the theme of those Psalms. Um, so the Medrash says, how do you know? What's the reason? Why did he say that? So in Psalm 124, maybe I'll open it up. Let's open it up. Okay, this is actually very funny because this is a psalm to David. David is writing the psalm. Let's read Psalm 124, a song of ascents of David. Had it not been for the Lord who was with us, let Israel declare now. Had it not been for the Lord who was with us when men rose up against us, 
then they would have swallowed us raw when their anger was kindled against us. Then the waters would have washed us away. Illness would have passed over our soul. Then the wicked waters would have passed over our soul. Blessed is the Lord who did not give us as prey to their teeth. Our soul escaped like a bird from the hunter's snare. The snare broke and we escaped. Our help was in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So this is a beautiful psalm, thanking God, saying if God would not was not with us, would not have been with us when men rose up against us, then we would be washed away by the water. Then the, pe um, the people would, 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 um, would, be, would become prey to the teeth of the wicked and thank God God was with us. That's the, med that's the, that's the psalm. Who's saying the psalm? David, Psalm of David, says the Medrash. If you look at this verse, he says in, the in, verse, in, chap in chapter 124, verse 1, had it not been for the Lord who was with us, let Israel declare now. Who is Israel? Conventional interpretation, Israel is the Jewish people. Says the Medrash, no, Israel is our grandfather Israel, right? Jacob has two names, as we'll read next week's Parsha. His, name's is Yisra his name is um, Jacob and Israel. And now this Psalm is, if God would not was not with us, says Israel. Who's Israel? Israel is Jacob. When Jacob was in the house of Haran, he says, if God would not with us, was not with me, I would not have been, been successful in, um, in, sur in surviving. So that is what the Medrash says. The Medrash says that what did Jacob do in, in Haran for 20 years? Well, he had what to say because he had the 15 Psalms and he said the 15 Psalms. Why the 15 Psalms that all begin Song of Ascents? Why the 15 Psalms? Because one of, the Psalm, one of those Psalms say, mention Israel, and that refers to Israel, our father. So this is very strange. First of all, why 15 Psalms, right? Why, why not one? He's saying one, why 15? So, so we start analyzing this. When we say, what did Jacob say? We don't mean, what did he do every day? From morning to night, he got up and said all the Psalms, because we know he was busy. He tells Love and his father-in-law that I worked for you with all my might. And by day, by night, so he's completely preoccupied with working, with dealing with the sheep and the cattle of his father-in-law. So it's not a question, what would he say? The question is, what did he say to give, to give him encouragement? What did Jacob say? What meditation or what idea did he think about to be able to give him the encouragement to remain loyal to himself, to his, to his values, even though he was in a very difficult place, in a very distant place, in a foreign place, both physically and spiritually, different from the way where he would want to be. And that is what the, 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 the psalm is asking, what the, the Medrash is asking, what gave him the, what, what did he say? What gave him the power and the strength and the encouragement to survive in that hostile environment? both physically hostile and spiritually hostile. He was dealing with a father-in-law who would constantly cheat him, um, beginning for giving him the other lay instead of Rachel to marry, but that's, that's, the, that's the whole story sp spelled out in the Torah. But in any case, what, and that, so, that, so there the Medrash is saying, what gave him the encouragement? What gave him the encouragement is those 15 Psalms. Why these 15 Psalms? Psalms is a nice book, 150 Psalms. There are many other books in the Bible. Last night we watched a video of Nathan Sharansky who says what gave him the strength was Psalm 23. So why 15 why these 15 Psalms? We don't know yet. But that's the first thing. The first thing is when the Medrash says, what did he say? means what gave him encouragement. Um. Oh, I missed one point. That same Medrash that says that Jacob said the 15, the 15 uh, Psalms, there's another opinion. Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachman, that was the opinion of Rabbi Shua ben Levi, who says 15 Psalms. Rabbi, Rabbi Shmuel ben Nachman says, no, 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 he didn't say 15 Psalms. He said the whole book of Psalms. Not specific to those 15 Psalms. And what, how do you know? What's the reason? Because there's a verse that says in Psalms, the Kaddish, you God are holy, you dwell on the praises of Israel. God likes to hear the praises of Israel. Who's Israel? Again, simply it means the collective Jewish people. 
But this matter says, no, Israel is Israel the father, the, is Israel Sava, Israel our grandfather, which is Jacob. Jacob our grandfather, his name was, was Israel. So in other words, so we see a precedent that God likes to hear the praises of, of Jacob, of Israel, and Jacob praised God, so he said all the Psalms. So if you tell me he said all the Psalms, that is already easier to understand. He praised God, why not? But if you're going to tell me it's specifically these 15 Psalms, then what is it about these 15 Psalms that gives ja that give Jacob the that give Jacob the encouragement that he needs? Who was the one who said it was only the 15? That's Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. So this is Bereshus Rabbah. Bereshus Rabbah is Medrash Rabbah, the most famous Medrash on Genesis, on, on the five books of Moses, really. And, and, and there he quotes, like I said, he quotes this idea where he says, what did he say? Rabbi Shua ben Levi says, again, the authors of the Medrash are the same, same are the sages of the Talmud. Rabbi, Rabbi Shua ben Levi was one of the great Tal Talmudic uh, scholars. And he would say, he says, he says all, all 15, 15 songs of praise. And then there's Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachman, who is already later generation. He was the generation of the Amoraim, the sages of the Talmud. And he says, no, he says all the Psalms. So what's more interesting for us is the one who says 15. What about 15? What's unique about these 15? Okay, so now we have a question that we have to we have to we have to uh, we have to deal with. Okay, so we're going to begin and making some progress based on an interpretation on the book of Psalms from the great sage called the Chida. Chida is an acronym, Chaim Yosef David Azulai. He was a great Sephardic um, rabbi and author. He passed away in the early 19th century, I think 1804 or something in that area. And he was extremely prolific. I think he wrote like 100 books. And he was very interesting because he was a Sephardic, a Sephardic rabbi, so he was engaged in the Kabbalah. So he has a lot of Kabbalistic interpretations with, throughout his interpretations. He's also famous for, he has interpretations specifically for the, the Medrashic stories in the Talmud, and he's very prolific. So he has a book, he has a commentary on the Psalms, and he says as follows. He says, why are there 15? Um, Psalms that begin a song of ascent. Why 15? And if David's going to sing, may he sing 20? Why 15? What's the significance of 15? So he does as he says as follows. He does the math. And he says, if you do the math, you will see that there were 15 years that all the patriarchs lived together throughout those 15 years. In other words, we're 15 years where Abraham and Jacob lived together. So in other words, what you're saying is you're saying that Jacob, when Abraham passed away, Jacob was 15 years old. What's the math? So let's see if you can do the math. Abraham lived 175 years. Isaac was born when Abraham was 100 years old. Okay, so when when, when Abraham was 100, Isaac was born. When does Jacob pass? When was Jacob born? So the Torah says clearly Jacob was born when Isaac was 60. So, how old was Abraham when Jacob was born? Abraham was 160, right? Because he was 100 when he gave birth to Isaac. Isaac was, was 60 when he gave birth to Jacob. So, Abraham was 160 years old when Isaac was born. So, now when Abraham passes away at 175, Jacob is 15. Simple math. 
And again, you don't need the Medrash, it's clearly in the Torah. So if you follow the verses of the Torah, you see there are 15 years where all the patriarchs live together. That's what the Chida writes. He doesn't connect it to this specific Medrash. So now here's what the, what the Rebbe says. The Rebbe says, look, when you tell me that Jacob needs the encouragement of the Psalms, and he says these 15 Psalms, so have keeping in mind that the 15 Psalms correspond to the 15 years that Jacob and that, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all are living together simultaneously on this earth. This could help us explain why Jacob, how Jacob gets sp um, spiritual encouragement specifically from this verse, from these 15 verses, from these 15 Psalms, I should say. So what does that mean? It means as follows. It means that we know and talk about this all the time. Abraham has a specific quality of how he serves God, and that is love. And Isaac has a specific quality, how he serves God, and that is discipline and awe. And Jacob has a specific quality, which is compassion, which we can talk about. What does Jacob understand? Jacob understands if you want to survive in a hostile environment, you cannot just remain within your own comfort zone, your spiritual comfort zone, and serve God the way you would rather do if you were living in your own peace and serenity. You're going to have to uh, incorporate the qualities of Abraham and Isaac and your own and Jacob to be able to survive in this hostile environment. So in other words, when we say that what gave him, what, what, what gave him the encouragement to survive was the 15 Psalms, what we're saying really, the Medrash says 15 Psalms, but the Medrash expects you to understand that 15 Psalms correspond to the 15 years that all the patriarchs live together. You cannot just stick to your own um, preferred way of serving God or your own preferred way of living, but you have to incorporate all three primary, primary emotions in your service of God, and that's how you're going to be able to survive. Now, the Rebbe doesn't talk about this, but I think that it's true that this is also perhaps why um, Jacob is most affected. In other words, uh, um, Jacob is most successful in relating to all of his children. And all of, all of his children, although many, although they were not perfect and certainly some have sinned, but they all remained within the fold. And they all remained with loyal to, lo loyal to their father's teachings and to their father's legacy. And they all remained, became the 12 tribes of Israel because he was able to relate to each of them because he didn't, he was not only trapped within his own box, within his own nature and the way he would serve God, but he was able to express himself and understand the children who were more like their, their grandfather and great-grandfather. In other words, he, his, he, did, he did not only relate on one level, he was able to relate to each child based on what that child needed because within himself, he was also to go able to go beyond his own dominant quality and also incorporate the quality of Abraham and of Isaac. Rebbe, why is it yeah. only those, those specific 15 psalms? Those, those specific, because the first thing that came to my mind when we read it, the beginning of it, that when we read for somebody, we only read the, the psalm of the age. So the, those, those 15 will kind of remain out of scope because huh. nobody lives these days to come up to 120. Well, there's different ways of reading psalms. We read psalms the way it's divided into 30 and every day of the month, we read one day. So day 27 of the month is when we read the 15 Songs of Ascent, chapter 120 to chapter 120, 134. So we say it once a month. Then there are other people who say Psalms even more, even more, um, um, uh, uh, more they say more of the Psalms each day, and they would read Psalms the way it's divided into the days of the week. And the way it's divided into days of the week, you finish it once a week. And therefore, if I'm not mistaken, yes, um, that psalm, those psalms, Shira Mahalot, they would say every Shabbat. Because the, I think, I don't remember exactly where it starts for Shabbat. I think, yes, I think it starts at 120. Yeah, 120 starts the, 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 the portion for Shabbat. So there are various ways of reading the psalm. So it's not just for people who live to 120 years old. Uh, it could be said otherwise. But again, according to the Medrash, it's not so much about the specific 
theme of, according to the way, the way we're interpreting the Medrash, it's not so much about the specific theme of the Psalms, it's more the number 15. Later on, we'll see if we have time, the second half of the talk, the Rebbe talks about the idea of a song of ascents, incorporating the idea of a song of ascents. So we'll see if we get there. But where we are right now, it's not so much about the 15, it's, about, it's not so much about the specific theme. We know there are 15 Psalms that have one theme, Song of Ascents. We know what the Chida writes, that this is corresponds to the 15 years that all the patriarchs live together. That's the significance of the number 15. So we're putting two and two together and we're saying, when you say, well, how, what did, how did Jacob get the encouragement to survive? Um, how did Jacob get the encouragement to survive? It's because he was able to incorporate all the qualities, both of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and being able to use all the qualities allows you to be able to operate in all different environments, right? If a person has a specific quality, the quality of love, so that can help you in certain environments. If you're disciplined, that can help you in other environments, but it's not always the same. Sometimes you're very disciplined, you come on time, but you don't know how to express love. So that doesn't help for all children. That doesn't help for all circumstances, right? You know how to show compassion, Jacob is compassion. But the question is, could, if you could, if, you, if you're to survive in a hostile environment, you're going to need to incorporate all the primary qualities, all three primary qualities, and that's how you can survive. And that's the encouragement. So we have that. So we said that these are the first two sections of the talk. There's uh, how many chapters? There is um, there's seven. We did the first two. I want to do at least three and four. So three and four is a very interesting concept. There's a concept. Three takes the same idea and just elaborates upon it. And four goes completely Kabbalistic. What is Tesla 15? How is Yud and Hey? We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So if you needed some Kabbalah for the morning, stick around. We'll get to the fourth se section, the fourth chapter, and you'll get plenty of Kabbalah. Okay. So let's think about this for a second. What does three say? So I don't know the exact historic details. I should go research. I should have done some more research. But in the days of Rabbi Shneir Zalman, the founder of Chabad, in his early days, there was a big war. There was a war in Europe. I think there was a seven year war. I think it was, uh, I think Germany was involved. It wasn't Germany then, but I don't remember the details of exactly historic details. But this war fascinated the, uh, the Hasidim. Both Rabbi Shneir Zalman wrote about it. His grandson, Atzan Atzadik, wrote about it. And Rabbi Shneir Zalman says he heard about this war from his teacher, who was the son of the Magid. The Magid of Mezrich, the Magid was the, was the, was the Magid of Mezrich was the successor of the Baal Shanto, the founder of the Hasidic movement. And Rabbi Shneir Zalman came to the Magid. And when he came to the Magid, there's all stories. He wasn't sure if he wants to stay or he wants to go. They end, he ended up saying that the Magid told his son, Rabbi Avraham, to study with Rabbi Shneir Zalman. They made a partnership. He would teach him Kabbalah and Hasidic philosophy. Rabbi Avram would teach Rabbi Shneir Zalman. Rabbi Shneir Zalman came from Lithuania. He had no background in the Hasidic movement. And in turn, as payment, Rabbi Shneir Zalman would pay by teaching him the revealed part of Torah, the Talmud, and all the commentaries on the Talmud. So that was a sort of a trade-off. You teach me Kabbalah, I teach you law. Okay. The Hasidim have a story that Rabbi Shneir Zalman would steal time. Rabbi Avram, the son of the Magid was a deeply mystical man, and he was not really aware of, his, of, of, of the presence of what's going on and how time is passing. So Rabbi Shneir Zalman wanted more time. He would give him an hour, but he wanted an hour and a half back. So he would steal. How would he steal? He would move the clock back. And he would move the clock back, and he would get more time because Rabbi Avram looks at his watch. Oh, we only learned it for 15 minutes. Maybe we're learning for 45 minutes. But he turned the clock back so he would cheat and get more time. So that's the story he was told. But the bottom line is this, Rabbi Shneir Zalman says that I heard about this war from Rabbi Avram. And what did Rabbi Avram said? Rabbi Avram said, that consistent with the Hasidic movement, which, which, which is that consistent with the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, that whatever you see in the world is really a lesson in the service of God. So they heard about this war and they said, what's the, what's the, less, what's the lesson from, from Hashem? And this, is, this, was, this was a big deal. What was the big deal? Up to that point, at least in that region, wars were fought head on. You had two armies and both armies fight with each other head on and the one that was more powerful and the one who's stronger wins. That was the conventional war fighting. What happened with this war? What happened with this war is that the, the side that, that was successful was the side that had less power, less firepower, less armor. They were, they, were, they were not as strong. But the reason why they were victorious is because they divided their camp into three 
and the three they put three of their of their of their armies against one in other words up to that point you had an army divided into three and they would face off so three parts of your army would face off against three parts of the other army and each one is battling the other the other army and the one who's stronger wins so with this with this with this battle what they did in this battle is that the victorious side took their entire army, divided it into three, and attacked and surrounded a third of the other army. And that's how they won. And that's how they won, even though they had lesser numbers. In other words, they put all their might only to one small part of the enemy. And therefore, even though overall they were less powerful, but in every confrontation, they were more powerful. So that was the war. And we have to find out exactly uh, the historical details of the war, but that was the war. What was so fascinating about this? So what's fascinating about this is that Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Avram tells Rabbi Shneir Zalman, Rabbi Shneir Zalman wrote about it and so did his grandson. He says like this, he says, look, a person has love to God. If you have love for God, but we discussed this a few weeks ago, there's also a negative love. Everything that God creates is zelu umaze, one opposite the other. So if you have a love to God, God also created a love for negativity, a love for the physical world, a love for temptation or negative temptation. So there's always going to be a battle between your love and between the love for love for positivity, love for holiness, and love for negativity. And the same is true with awe. Person is in awe of God, and that overtakes him. But there's also an awe, a negative awe, which is I'm afraid of something within this world. I'm paralyzed. I'm afraid to fail. I'm afraid of rejection. So there is negative awe as well. And again, the question is, I have a battle of which awe is going to guide me. Is it going to be the positive awe or is it going to be the negative awe? And usually the way the people fought battles is the confrontation. What do I love? Am I going to align my love with a love for God or am I going to align my love with a love for negativity? And what happens is a battle. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So all of a sudden, after this war, the Hasidim saying, one second, one second. Don't fight your love versus the love of negativity. You take all your divine qualities and apply them to every single battle. In other words, if you are tempted, if you're feeling love to God, and you're tempted with a love for negativity, don't just come and say, well, I know the negativity is attractive, but God is also attractive. That would be going love for love head on. And who wins? Whoever wins. But if you can come with your other qualities as well and bring them to this battlefield and put all your forces within to this battlefield of the love, then you will be successful. In other words, if simultaneously we're trying to figure out, which, we're trying to direct your love toward God as opposed to toward negative love, you can also introduce awe. And you can also introduce the idea of humility and compassion. If you can bring all your spiritual qualities to every single confrontation, you will win, win even, the, even if you're weaker because your animal soul is so strong. But that's only you're only weaker if you go head on one quality for the other quality. But if you put all your forces into every battle, you're going to win. Now we're gonna come full circle back to the story of Jacob. The story of Jacob, how does Jacob have encouragement in those 15 years is, I'm sorry, how does Jacob has, have encouragement to overcome the, the, the temptation and the negativity and the challenges within those 20 years of being in the house of Lavan is because he said all 15 Shir Hamalot. What does it mean to say all 15 Shir Hamalot? That means that he can come and put all the divine qualities to work for him, the quality of Abraham, the quality of love, the quality of Isaac, which is the quality of awe, and the quality of compassion, which is a blend of, the, of, of each. And he has all of those powers at his disposal, and he's able to bring them both to the battle at the same time. Now the question is, what does this mean in practical language? Practical language is sometimes love doesn't alone is not going to work. And you also have to have awe. So for example, I love my son. I love my daughter. I love my spouse. I love my grandmother. It doesn't matter. But not always would the love motivate me to do the right thing because sometimes I'm, my love also pulls me elsewhere. 
So at those points, if I'm a person who's only thinking about one quality at a time, I'm vulnerable because I love the people closest to me, but I also love temptation. So how am I, so, so, so there's, a, there's a head on battle and we'll see who wins. But what happens if together with love, I can also introduce the idea of awe. What does the idea of awe mean? Awe is fear. And fear, we're all motivated by fear. We don't like to think about fear because we like to think about, uh, we don't like to feel like we're motivated by fear, but fear is a very important human quality and it can be used in a very powerful way. For example, I love you. That itself wouldn't motivate me to do the right thing right now, but I don't want to hurt you. That's a fear. And sometimes that fear would get me to do the right thing more than just my love to you. You can think about it with children, you can think about spouses, you can think about it in all different ways. Or I don't want to fear, I fear to hurt you, or I fear to lose you. Okay, so that's a fear. And we're not, and everybody has fears. Everybody is motivated by fears. The question is, are the fears healthy fears? Or is it a fear that's paralyzing? Or is it a fear of something good or something positive? Like to protect something, you don't want to lose it. That's a, that's a, that's a positive fear. So now the question is, like I said, I love you. I want to be devoted to you, but I'm also distracted from my other loves. So if it's just, if I view this battle as which love is going to prevail, I may win, I may lose. The love, whoever's stronger, whichever love is stronger, it will win. And often the love of the animal soul is stronger because the animal has more, more passion than a human being. So what do I need to do? So if I'm someone who's just motivated by love, I just know how to awaken my love, I'm vulnerable, I may lose. But if I can, when I have this battle of my love is being pulled in two directions, if I can put another force into this battle, if I can come and I could say, um, if I can come and I could say that, um, if I can come and I could say that, that I'm going to also introduce awe into the equation. I love you, but that's not the only thing I feel toward you. I also, I'm afraid to harm you. I'm a, I don't want to cause you pain. Right? I certainly don't want to lose you. I don't want you to be traumatized, whatever it may be. If I can introduce the idea of awe together with the idea of love, then I'm like that uh, battle where they figured out you don't have to be stronger in overall terms. You just have to be stronger in every confrontation. And this became, by the way, I think this became modern warfare. I think that's, that's the idea of, I don't know if it's the exact blitzkrieg, but it's certainly what Israel did in the Six Day War they have to make sure they understood, they, they study the Blitzkrieg and they understand that they have to use all their um, armor in a form that we're, they use it as a, as a, the, the, the metaphor is you use it as a, as, a, uh, as a fist. You put all your armor in one place and you punch in that area. In other words, wherever you're, deal, wherever you're confronting the enemy, you, are, you have more than he has in that region even though in overall numbers, you're weaker. So this all begins from that battle and it all begins from what Rabbi, Rabbi Avram the Malach told Rabbi Shneir Zalman, that he said, you gotta read the newspaper and you have to understand that there's a new way to do warfare. And the new way to do warfare is don't be so in the box. Don't battle love with love. Don't battle all with all. Don't battle compassion for compassion. Whenever there's a confrontation, you put all three of your, of your armies attacking one element of the enemy's army. And that's the 13, and that has many ramifications. We can elaborate. We'll take a few questions, and I want to also read four, because that connects to the number of 15. yud hey, according to Kabbalah, we'll get to that in a minute. But in the meantime, any comments, questions, jokes, historical analysis, uh, military strategy, whatever you want to put into, 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 into the discussion, please, please jump in. Rabbi, I did have a question about Jacob because his attribute is attribute of compassion, and it's already a combination of love and awe. Right. So was that because he was he lived in the same fifteen years with 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 the, his grandfather and uh, and yes. his father at the same time he he was able to develop that quality yes. and he was born with it maybe he was born with it but in any case um, not all three even come in, you because now you answered my question because you said compassion is also in the mix and probably the other attributes as well right. Yeah, but we believe, according to the Kabbalah, the other attributes are just, a, are, are just an expression of the first three. So there are seven emotional attributes. The first three are the more dominant ones. In other words, the main, the primary emotions are the first three. Because, and then the others, the others four, three or four, are really branches of the first three. So we can talk about it, but assuming these are the primary emotions. But even, so you're right. Compassion is a blend, uh, according to the Kabbalah, compassion is a blend of love and awe. 
Why that is, we'll talk, maybe I'll talk about that in a second. So give me a second, I'll talk about it. But even so, sometimes you need raw love, right? Sometimes you need raw love. Sometimes compassion is not enough. Sometimes one child needs raw love and that needs unadulterated love, right? So let's talk about this for a second. Why do we say that compassion is a blend between love, between, between, between love or giving and gavura, which is the left side, which is strength, which is discipline, which is holding back. So here's the conversation. This is what they, this is, this is how you think about it in the most basic level. So let's say you have three judges. One, it represents chesed, love. The other, that's the right side. The other represents gavura, strength, discipline, that's the left side. And the middle one represents compassion. So let's hear the conversation. Somebody comes before the judge and says, is this person worthy of kindness? Should, I, should we give this person whatever? Should we, give this, should we give to this person? So chesed kindness says yes. Why? Chesed only sees good in people. When I'm in love, love is blinding. I don't see your faults. If I love you, I don't see your faults. If I see your faults, I don't love you, by the way. Right? How do I know? Not that I, if I see your faults. Your faults are like my faults. I know my faults, but they don't bother me. So if I love you, it's not that I don't know your faults. It just doesn't bother you. Because I love my, I, my self-love, my faults don't interfere with my self-love. So your faults shouldn't interfere with my love to you. So love says, I don't see bad in anybody. Everyone's deserving. Everyone's deserving. Comes compassion, comes, comes discipline and says, you're crazy. And says, that's, 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 that's ridiculous. The person is not deserving. Don't give him. If you give him, you're going to make it worse. You're just going to encourage bad behavior. So you have a scenario where kindness, loving kindness, the, the emotion to give wants to give all the time, but the emotion to withhold and withdraw says, no, don't give. Why shouldn't you give? Because if you give, it's actually counterproductive. Why? Because the person is not deserving. So chesed kindness says everyone is deserving. Givura strength says in some sense, no one is deserving or very few people are deserving. But in some sense, no one is deserving because we're no one's perfect, so no one's deserving. So now these are the two, these are the two angles. How do, you get, how do you get compassion? What's the third? And, and how come compassion makes peace between the two? In Judaism, one and two always argue, three makes peace. Three is the symbol of peace. One is not peace, by the way. One is dominance. One is before the world was created, God was one. Nobody disagreed with him because no one else existed, right? That's not peace. Peace is when there are two people who have different perspectives. And the third is when they can blend together. Okay, so going back to our metaphor. Kindness says everybody is worthy. Discipline cannot agree with that. Impossible. Not everybody's worthy. What do you do? You're in denial. So these people cannot agree. They're never going to make peace. But then they both could make peace with compassion. What does compassion say? Compassion says you're not deserving. Gavura discipline is right. You're not deserving. You're right. So I agree, I agree with you, 50%. You're, not, you're, the guy, you're right, the guy is not deserving. But compassion says, I give you not because you're deserving. I give you because I have compassion, because you're suffering, because you're in pain, whatever the case is, because I'm connected to you emotionally. It doesn't matter what compassion. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. What compassion, what's the essence of compassion? But the bottom line is compassion says, despite the fact that you're not deserving, I'm going to give it to you any, anyway. That is a formula that both the kindness and the, and the, and the, and the judgments could agree upon. Because kindness says everyone's deserving. Compassion doesn't agree with that, but compassion agrees with the bottom line of kindness. We're gonna give despite, despite the fact that the guy's not deserving. Meanwhile, Gavura, strength, discipline says the guy's not deserving, tells kindness that he's not deserving, why are you giving him? So compassion says, you're right, he's not deserving. Ah, I'm right, I'm happy. Oh, you wanna give him despite not being deserving? I'm not offended by that. I'm offended by saying everyone's deserving. And that's how you have the blend. So compassion is not exactly like kindness. Kindness is love, sees good in everybody. And sometimes your children, you have to give them, but they have to know that they're not deserving. And they're not God's gift to the world. I mean, they are, but I'm saying their action is not perfect. And not, this is not love. I don't love you at this moment. Why am I giving it to you? Because I feel bad for you. In other words, I feel compassion. I feel, I don't feel bad. I feel compassion because you are. What does compassion mean? Compassion is when someone is suffering, when somebody's in pain, Human nature is that you want to connect to that person. We can talk about that. I talked about them in the past. The fascinating, fascinating, fascinating phenomenon. But the bottom line is, it's not saying you're good. It's not saying you're deserving. To the contrary, I don't care who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're bleeding in the street, I feel connected to you. Are you deserving? No. But you're in pain. If you're in pain, I'm here for you. 
And my children know that, that even when they're not deserving, if they're in pain, hopefully the parent will be there for them. But that's very different than love. Sometimes you need compassion. Now, compassion happens to be a blend of, 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 of love and discipline, but it's not the same thing. It's a third quality. It, it blends the two, but, it, but, it, but the product is a, is a different one. So Jacob is the product of compassion, but sometimes he has to come in with, with, with unadulterated love. And sometimes with strength and discipline. That's why Jacob is actually very strong. He, are, he, 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 he stands up to his father-in-law. It's against his nature. And he, and, he, and, he, and he faces confrontation. He's not afraid of confront. He's not natural to him, but, he, but he's able to, to deal with confrontation. He's able to deal with people who trick him. And he actually could probably trick them back in a sense. So the bottom line is he can co- incorporate the quality of Isaac as well. So that's why he's successful. Because some people, they're very good at what they do. But then when there's a challenge, it challenges them in the sense that now they have to exercise a quality that is not natural to them. They shut down. I can't do it. It's not me. It's not who I am. I'm good at, at a certain type of, 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 of challenge. But this challenge, this challenge is totally different from my spiritual toolbox. Says Jacob, no. Says Jacob, you need to have all qualities at your disposal. You have to be able to awaken all, all, all primary emotions. You know, sometimes my kid needs discipline. I say, go to my wife. I'm not interested in dealing with it, right? No, that's a mistake. That means you're not going to be able to communicate with all your children. You have to be able to incorporate all of the qualities. How to do so? Now we get to the section number four and say, what about the number 15 helps us incorporate all primary emotions? In other words, helps us go out of our emotional box, helps us go out of our emotional spiritual makeup and allow us to awaken another emotion when necessary. So it's all alluded to in the number 15, according to the Kabbalah. So now we have a few minutes left. We're not going to get to the song part, Shiram Alice, which, but, but the, 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 and, and the point is that Jacob is also full of optimism and joy, but we don't have time to get into that. But I want to get into the number 15, Kabbalistically speaking. So number 15, according to the Kabbalah, represents the intellectual spirit. Why so? Because we know that there are four letters of God's name, yud Hey vav Hey. The first two, yud Hey represent Chachma, wisdom, and Bina, understanding, two of the three spir- um, intellectual qualities. And the last two letters, vav hey, represent the emotions. So I can make a chart and we can think about it. Um, we can make a chart and we can think about it. Okay, let's make a chart for five. We'll do, we'll do a quick chart about the four letters of God's name. Okay, right, we have technology for a reason. Okay, I don't want to spell it, so I put a dash between each letter. Yud, hey, vav, hey. These are the four letters of God's name, according to the Kabbalah. According to the Kabbalah, these four letters also correspond to the 10 spirit. Yud is chachma, yud is wisdom. Why is yud wisdom? Because an idea that comes into your head, the idea begins with a kernel. That's wisdom, the new idea, the flash of, of, of insight. Then you have Bina. Hey is Bina. What is Bina? Bina is understanding, which is you take the flash of insight and you expand it. And that's why the Yud is just one dot, whereas the Hey has breadth and length, right? It goes wide and long because you're expanding the idea. That is Yud, Hey, Chachma, Bina, mother, father, mother. Father is the Chachma, the wisdom, because even biologically, the father gives the seed. And Bina is the mother because the mother expands the seed into a child within the nine months of labor, of, of, of uh, pregnancy. Okay, so the first two are Chachma. Are Chachma and Bina, the two, the t- wisdom and understanding, intellectual spirit. By the way, the two, these two letters make their own name of God. yud is also the own, a name of God. vav is not, but yud is its own name of God. Then you have vav What is Vav? Vav 
is, is, is drawing down, but it also has a numerical value of six. Vav is the letter six. So there are six emotions, six plus malchot. So six is emotions. For, so from the intellectual spherot, you get the emo, you, get, you get the creation of an emotional uh, response. So you have an idea within your head. An idea within your head, the awareness within your head, when you have an awareness, the awareness is that something is good that produces uh, emotions within your heart. What kind of emotions? The whole, the whole gamut. I love it. I want it. I, I'm afraid to lose it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the vav. And the final hey would actually be malchut, but in practically speaking, it's action, speech and action. When I bring it into the world, I'm expanding into the real world. So these are the four letters of God's name, in short, and the four and the, and the, and the ten and how they express themselves in the ten spherot. Bottom line, what's relevant for us is yud hey. Yud has a numerical value of ten, and hey is the numerical value of five. So when you say fifteen, you're referring to the first two. You're referring to the first two letters. That's the 15. In other words, you're dealing with intelligence. Now, why is intelligence the solution? Because when a person is emotional, emotion is subjective. And it's much harder to go away, to change your emotional response because the emotional response, your emotion is much more rooted in who you are and your personality. But the way to do so if you are to change and say, I don't like my emotional response, I need a new emotional response tailored to this situation. So the way I have to do that is I have to introduce the intellectual capacity. I have to be able to use my mind because the mind is subjective, is objective. And the mind can tell me what your response now is not healthy. And the mind gives us flexibility to be able to awaken a different emotional response. So if I'm in a scenario with my, with, in a relationship, let's say with my children, and for whatever reason, I'm triggered. What does it mean I'm triggered? My emotional response was activated in a way that I'm stuck. I cannot feel like I, I cannot give the child what they need because my emotional response is pulling me in another direction. So what do I need to do? I need to say the 15 shir hamalot. What does 15 shir hamalot mean? I have to say one second. Right now you're feeling love or awe or pain. You have to be able to inch, bring other factors, other part of your personality into this battle, into this confrontation. But I can't, I'm stuck. I'm stuck in my emotional response. Ah, now you need 15. What's 15? You're, hey, you're a human being. Think about this intellectually. Move away from emotional response and go to a response of the mind. What is your mind telling you? And that helps you shift gears and allows you to bring other factors of this, other factors, other emotion, emotions um, into this conf into this scenario, into this interaction. I was going to say confrontation, but I meant interaction. And that's why the number 15 is significant because we're dealing here with 15 represents in the final analysis, 15 represents, first of all, it represents the 15 years that the patriarchs lived together. In other words, the ability to have various emotional responses at your disposal and the ability to move between them and the ability to move away from the more, the more dominant emotion that is within your personality and the ability to awaken the emotions that are less dominant. But how do you do so? You have to have the number 15. You have to be able to go to the yud -hey. You have to be able to go to the intellectual uh, perspective, which is far more objective than the emotional. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the first half of the talk. Well, we're already 1056. So to summarize, Jacob is able to su survive amongst the challenges because he understood modern warfare. Modern warfare is you don't go up against the other army head to head. You take your army, you divide it into three and you attack from all sides, but you attack not the entire army. You attack a small portion of the army because what you're doing is you're putting your forces, all your forces against one small um, uh, uh, um, section of the enemy's army. What does that mean spiritually? Spiritually, that means is that when you are dealing with, your, for example, the quality of love and the quality of love is challenged to think about um, uh, negative loves, you can't just rely on your love, the positive love versus the negative love. You also have to bring other forces into the battle or compassion. I don't want to, I, I don't want to hurt the other person I love. I don't want, I'm afraid I'm going to um, lose the person I love. Those are very good qualities to bring into battle in addition to the feeling of love, 
because you need a multi-pronged approach to overcome the enemy if the enemy is stronger than you. And that's the ability of bringing all forces into the battle and moving between the forces and moving between the emotional forces. And the way we do that, I'm not a person of awe. I'm not a person that likes to, that is motivated by fear. But think about it. Think about what kind of pain you'll cause yourself unto the other person if you succumb to this temptation. And think about that. And you'll be able to move to other emotion if you bring in the element of the 15, which again, the 15 represents the moichin, the intellectual objective part of the soul, which is far more easier to activate than to try to activate the emotions directly. And when you, in, 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 when you, and when, when you awaken the intellectual, the intellectual capacity and the intellectual perspective, then you'll be able to have all 15, the other emotional responses that are necessary in this given situation. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is a story in short. Comments, questions, all welcome. Otherwise, have a wonderful day, and we see each other in good health. Thank you very much. I haven't thought about this uh, talk in a while, so this was enjoyable, and, and um, I'm grateful to you for joining. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Wonderful day, everybody. You too.